Okay, please test it so that we don't have sound problems like yesterday. I'm not sure about this. This is not charging, so we're gonna have problems. As far as I can see, the battery is 15%. Okay, <laughs> let's get started while that problem is being solved. Okay, it's a bit late, huh? <laughs> so let's get started. We're gonna continue on caching. We've, done, we've covered a lot of caching issues yesterday, but there's more to cover. This is actually a fascinating subject and people have worked on caches for decades, as I said. Uh, there's a famous conference in computer architecture, International Symposium Computer Architecture. Sometimes people joke about this conference saying it's International Symposium on Cache Architecture. CA, computer architecture, cache architecture. I like that joke, but <laughs> I, I don't think that's true anymore, let's say. It used to be true at some point, there were so many caching uh, papers, but right now there's a lot of diversity uh, in the topics. Uh, okay, so I want to cover some uh, caching issues that we uh, couldn't cover yesterday. These are the same readings that you've been doing, and we're talking about the cache hierarchy, and we talked a lot about the design decisions within a cache as well as across cache levels, right? Uh, I will, and I also stretched your mind yesterday uh, saying that cache actually, cache hierarchy or memory hierarchy extends beyond a single server. But with, uh, within a single server, uh, memory hierarchy also extends. You can see that uh, uh, there it's hybrid memories uh, that are happening uh, today. You can see uh, main memory like DRAM, but then main memory is also expanding within a single server with additional uh, type of uh, uh, memories like phase change memory, but this could be different types of DRAM also. You could this could be, for example, high bandwidth memory, and this could be some other types of DRAM. So you can see that there's heterogeneity that's happening uh, in the memory hierarchy as well. And uh, in in many cases, the proposals are such that there's a fast DRAM that acts as a cache for a larger DRAM or larger phase change memory, if you will. Does that make sense? So you can see that there's a lot going on. So never think that. Uh, this is a static system where you have, where it looks like this, but things are changing around here. Things are changing around here. Things are changing also across the network uh, so that the main memory is expanding across the network, if you will. So that's why caching is extremely important, actually. Caching actually takes place in all of these different memories. All of these memories can be viewed as caches. So DRAM is really a cache for uh, uh, the storage system, as we will actually see in the next lectures about uh, virtual memory. Okay, so recall what we discussed yesterday. We talked a lot about issues in set associative caches, especially decisions that we make for insertion, promotion, and eviction replacement. I will not go over these again. I hear some echo. Is it because of me or is it because of something else? Okay, there's this noise. Tuck, tuck. <laughs> I saved the computer also. Uh, okay, and then uh, there is also. Uh, uh, design decisions that you make across the cache hierarchy in multi-level caches, right? So we've discussed these as well. Uh, we couldn't cover all of the design decisions, of course, but you can imagine there are many other design decisions that you need to make. Uh, so we also were covering uh, 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 different options for improving basic cache performance. There's a lot to cover here. We actually talked about a bunch of these over here. Uh, and we were talking about software approaches. We finished the software approaches. There are more software approaches you can talk about, but uh, Otherwise, we will be spending, uh, we will be renaming this course uh, to digital design and cache architecture. Let's not do that. <laughs> but let me cover some things that uh, are not, let's say, uh, challenge the conventional wisdom, uh, which is going to be this uh, cost uh, of cache misses. So if you think about uh, miss latency or miss cost, what is that affected by? We discussed this, but let's take a look at it in a bit more detail. So this is affected by two things. One is where does the miss get serviced from? Does it get serviced from the next level, et cetera? We'll see that. And how, do, how much does the miss actually stall the processor? In the end, the most important one is the second one, actually. But I will kind of try to break down these two things uh, into separate pieces. So the miss can get uh, serviced from the next level in the cache hierarchy, right? If you get an L1 cache miss, the next uh, access to the L2 can be a hit for that. Then it's a short latency cache miss, right? But the miss actually can go out all the way to remote memory. In that case, it's actually uh, a long latency cache miss. 
And then if, you, if it actually goes to DRAM, it could be a row hit. Remember the DRAM uh, lecture that we had? You can have a row hit versus row conflicts. You can have conflicts in the bank rank channel. All of those actually increase the latencies of the cache emiss that you're, uh, that you're trying to bring into the cache hierarchy. So there are different latencies depending on where you hit in the hierarchy, where you hit in the DRAM, whether you get a conflict uh, on the bus, for example, or not. And you can have queuing delays in the memory controller and the interconnects if you're going to memory, uh, if you're going to a remote memory in the network. So there's actually delays that you experience. These all affect the latency uh, of uh, the miss. And as we discussed, local versus remote memory. Does the miss get serviced from the chip, from the same node, from the same rack, or some remote server, some memory blade, for example, that's far away? Uh, that all affects where, uh, the latency. And there could be other things that you can add over here. And the second option, the second thing that affects the missed latency or missed cost or experienced stall time is really the, this, uh, this uh, stall time, experienced stall time. Uh, this is affected by whether the miss is overlapped uh, by other latencies, uh, whether uh, the data is immediately needed by the processor also. So you may actually send a ca require a cache miss, but you may not need the data immediately. For example, this could be a cache miss because of a, a write request, and the processor doesn't need to stall uh, because the write request, the result of the cache, uh, the, the, the cache block is not needed for a dependent instruction immediately. That's different from a load instruction. For a load instruction, you get a cache miss and the data is not available, so the dependent instructions cannot execute. That hopefully makes sense, right? Uh, and then there's also other issues like uh, that, uh, that uh, affect the cost of a cache miss. What are you going to evict, right? Is, is, this, is this more costly uh, than some other cache miss that's going to be longer to refetch if it's needed later on, if you're assuming that you evicted it. So you can see that the, uh, you, once you start talking about missed latency and missed cost, especially, uh, this starts becoming a bit more hairy. There are a lot of uh, different things that get into play that affect how long does the cache miss take to service? And also how much of that latency is actually exposed to the processor as stall time in the end? Does that make sense? And these are not easy to determine. So, uh, but let's take a look at uh, one example of this. Uh, so this is the notion of memory level parallelism. And I alluded to it in an earlier lecture, but we never really looked at it. Uh, but uh, modern processors uh, can actually have different types of cache misses. So if you look at this cache miss over here, it's isolated. There is no other cache miss uh, that is happening at the same time over here, which means that this is the latency of this cache miss is fully exposed to the processor, assuming it stalls the processor, right? That's the assumption. But these two misses are serviced in parallel. You generate cache miss C and then cache miss B, and then they're serviced in parallel in different banks, for example, in DRAM. As a result, their latencies are overlapped. So that's the notion of memory level parallelism. It's really the notion of generating and servicing these multiple memory accesses in parallel. Now, if I tell you, if you, uh, uh, if you eliminate one miss out of these, which one would you eliminate to improve performance? These are the only three misses in your processor. If you want to improve performance by eliminating only one miss, if you had the option to eliminate only one, which one would you eliminate? Anybody? Don't be shy. Yes. A, exactly. So if you eliminate A, what happens is this, whatever request that is a miss right now will become a cache hit. You eliminated it. So the processor can continue processing, right? That's not true for B or C, right? If you eliminate B, the processor will still store for C because it's waiting for C. We're assuming that it's really waiting for the data to come back to, pro, uh, make, uh, to pro proceed, right? If you eliminate C, the same thing happens. The processor still needs to stall for B. So if you really want to get rid of the wait, uh, stall time due to uh, the second parallel misses, you have to eliminate both B and C. So eliminating A is roughly equivalent to eliminating B and C together, which means that a is a much more costly miss, right, from the perspective of performance uh, compared to B and C, and B and C are less costly. And this makes sense because what you're doing is you're parallelizing things. As you parallelize things, you're tolerating the latency of each of the misses, right? We talked about out-of-order execution. And in out-of-order execution, you're parallelizing different operations, meaning each operation appears less costly to the processor. So this is the, this is the fundamentals of real latency tolerance. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. So basically, there are many techniques that are proposed to improve memory level parallelism. Out of order execution is one of them. And we've seen that out of order execution is able to do this actually. It can generate different cache misses in parallel and they can be serviced in parallel in the main memory system. But this also leads to uh, 
some misses being isolated, some misses being parallel, and there's different levels of parallelism, right? I could have another example over here where you have eight misses serviced in parallel, and eliminating any of them will not actually buy you any almost almost any performance unless you eliminate all eight of them at the same time, right? Roughly, right? There's of course trailing edges and leading edges of misses when they start, when they end, how long they take. They're not always equal, like uh, this nice picture depicts as well. Okay, so the cost of a miss is affected by which other misses it is serviced with or how much memory level parallelism there is while the miss is actually being serviced. Now, the question is, how does this affect cache replacement? This clearly affects a lot of things, actually. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it some other time, perhaps, but let's look at cache, cache replacement since we're talking about caching. So basically, the issue is traditional cache replacement policies, whatever we talked about yesterday, it doesn't take this into account, even though this is actually important. And the realization of this is actually very interesting. They make this implicit assumption that reducing miscount reduces memory-related stall time. If you reduce miscount, that's always good for performance. I kind of foreshadowed in prior lecture saying that this is not necessarily true, right? So essentially, misses with varying cost or memory level parallelism in this particular case breaks this assumption. If the misses are not equally costly, this assumption is broken to begin with. So then the question is, how do you actually design a cache replacement policy that takes this into account. This, this is still low battery, by the way. Anybody? I don't know, you plugged it in, but I don't want the lecture to stop again. How long? Are you going to help or? OK, power source battery right now. Looks like it's working. I don't know. It's, is it working? It's not working. You have another one? OK. Yeah. OK, I mean, this is working, but you can keep it over there. Thanks. I don't know how that got disconnected. Let's check it once more. Okay, something is happening, but let's stop sharing. Okay, okay, let's go back. Ah. Okay, so we were here. Basically, um, any miss that uh, misses uh, that have varying cost or memory level parallelism breaks this assumption, as we discussed, right? And as, as we just discussed, eliminating an isolated miss helps performance more than eliminating a parallel miss. And eliminating a higher latency miss could help performance more than eliminating a lower latency miss. I said could over here because latency is not necessarily directly exposed to the processor, right? It also depends on uh, how much you have tolerated that latency. So I'm not going to uh, give you a solution to this, but I want to emphasize this because this is actually uh, becoming a lot more important in existing systems with very sophisticated memory hierarchies, with very sophisticated prefetchers, as we will discuss. You cannot ignore these stall times or the cost of a cache miss anymore, essentially. It's really, uh, uh, we need to really rethink the design of the caches such that they don't make this assumption. They basically don't take, they, they actually take the miss cost into account. Now let's take a look at an example. I like this example. Uh, when we constructed actually, I was quite happy. So if you look at this example, uh, what we're going to look at is a cyclic access pattern. Uh, the processor is, these are blocks to the same set, basically. Assume that this is the, the, your cache. You have only four blocks in your set, and that's your cache. You don't have anything else. And this is the access pattern that we're going to see to the caches, uh, cache. Uh, basically, blocks P4, P3, P2, P1 are accessed in this order. And then you touch blocks P1, P2, P3, P4. And then you touch blocks S1, S2, S3. And then this access pattern repeats, as you can see. It's a nice cyclic access pattern, like we have seen. Uh, the difference between P and S is uh, P uh, misses to blocks P1, P2, P3, and P4 can be serviced in parallel. And misses to blocks S1, S2, and S3 are isolated. Hopefully that makes sense, right? So basically, these misses are less costly from the processor's perspective. These misses are a lot more costly. Eliminating S1 actually uh, stops the stall of the processor completely. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, two replacement algorithm, one that minimizes the miscount optimally, which is Beldi's optimal. If you remember, Beldi's optimal uh, 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 replacement policy replaces the block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future. And that's why it's optimal. 
you can prove it. And we are going to also look at the MLP of our policy, as we call it, that actually targets these isolated misses and tries to keep them in the cache, tries to keep blocks S1, S2, and S3 in the cache. And we're going to look at a fully associative cache containing only four blocks, a single set, if you will. You can also think about it that way. So basically, what we're going to demonstrate is that fewest misses is not going to lead, you, lead to the best performance in this sort of access pattern. And how do you demonstrate that? Let's look at Beldi's optimal. Uh, so Beldi's optimal, if you actually do the analysis, uh, all of these should be hits in the steady state. Uh, I'll let you think about that. But assume that we start from that steady state. Uh, these four uh, accesses are hits, and the state of the cache at this point is P4, P3, P2, P1, because you've touched these. Clearly, these should be in the cache at this point, according to Beldi's optimal, right? That makes sense, right? That's the starting point, which means that the next accesses are all cache hits because they're essentially touching, touching the cache blocks in the cache. Fine. Now, when you get to this point, the cache looks like this. P4 is the most recently referenced. P1 is the least recently referenced, but that doesn't matter with Beldi's optimal. With Beldi's optimal, you, you ask the question, uh, whenever you see S1, S1 is going to replace the cache block and the cache that's going to be referenced furthest into the future. Now, what is furthest into the future among these? Well, P4 is the first into the future, if you actually go and follow the cyclic pattern. P3 is the next, P3, P2 is the next, and P4, P1 is the furthest into the future, as you can see. So P1 will be replaced by S1. Of course, it's a miss because it's not in the cache. So now uh, S1 is in the cache. Now again, S2 is not in the cache, so S2 is going to replace the block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future, which is going to be P2, if you do the same analysis. This is a miss. It's, uh, so, sorry, sorry, not P2. It's going to be S1, actually, right? You're going to replace S1 because S1 is going to be replaced furthest into the future, right? Because P2 is going to be referenced before S1. So we're going to replace S1. So S2 is going to replace S1. And similarly, S3 is going to replace S2 at this point. So you get misses in this S1, S2, and S3, and they're going to replace each other. And then when you get over here, you see P4. That's a hit, clearly. Uh, so these three are going to be hits because they're P4, P3, and P3 are, uh, P2 are in the cache. S3 is in the cache, uh, and now you have P1. P1 is a miss because it's not in the cache. And P1 is going to replace S3 because S3 is the one that's going to be referenced furthest into the future because you're going to reference P1, P2, P3, P4, all of them over here. OK, so that basically gets us back to the steady state. And if you look at the execution time of this, there is one miss here, which causes some amount of stall. Assume that it's some uniform amount of stall. Here, there's all hits. This, unfortunately, doesn't align too well. But if you look at this, there is one miss over here, one miss over here, one miss over here, one miss over here. So you have four misses in total, and you have four stalls, right? because they're kind of isolated stalls. Here, you have hits, so you don't stall for any of these. So that sounds good. This is basically the analysis with Beldi's optimal. You should be able to do this analysis and reverse engineer all of that. And there are beautiful cash questions that you can solve in the homework, et cetera. I have a favorite question, but I'm not going to tell you what that is right now. <laughs> OK, uh, not related to this, actually. It's, it's related to the cash structure. OK, so this is optimal, uh, optimal for minimizing miss rate. Let's take a look at what a cost aware or memory level parallelism aware replacement policy would do in this case. Basically, the purpose of this replacement policy is to keep these S1, S2, and S3 in the cache as much as possible, right? Because they're, they're much more costly. We would like to eliminate them, uh, eliminate the misses caused by them. We don't care as much about these because they're not very costly, as you can see, as we have discussed earlier, right? That's the theory. So basically, at the steady state, this MLP aware replacement policy should keep S1, S2, S3 in the cache at this point so that you get hits in all of these, right? And that should be doable, hopefully, with some heuristics, et cetera, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, but I'm going to demonstrate the issue or the benefits of this replacement policy. And based on some heuristics, maybe P4 is in the cache because that's the last thing you touched over here. OK, so this is the steady state. Now, you get hits in S1, S2, and S3 uh, as you access them over here. When you go over here, when you, know, you go back to the cycle, you want to keep S1, S2, and S3 in the cache. As a result, you get three misses over here, right? There's a, a hit in P4, but P3, P2, and P1 miss. OK. Maybe you replace P4 with P1, because that's the last referenced. Uh, in this case, you get a hit on P1, but P2, P3, and P4 miss. So you see that now we had six misses, and you get back to the steady state. So now we had six misses over here, but you have only two stalls, let's say, approximately. As a result, 
this is a much better replacement policy because it saves cycles, as you can see, right? You got rid of the stalls. You got rid of two stalls, basically. Make sense? So that's the importance of cost of a cash miss, essentially. Now the question is actually, how do you take this into account? How do you actually make it work? That's for a further course. <laughs> if you're interested in this, and uh, there's a lot of interesting things that uh, can be done in this area. This paper shows this example also, actually. Uh, and you can take a look at it. Basically, how do you incorporate this cost into replacement decisions? How do you design a hybrid cash replacement policy? Uh, in the end, uh, the replacement policy turns out to be hybrid because there are some access patterns uh, that benefit a lot from, uh, let's say, uh, recency-based replacement. And there are some access patterns that benefit a lot from cost-based replacement and you need to incorporate them somehow. But again, I'm not showing you the, uh, the policy over here. Okay, so this, I think, brings us uh, to the somewhat end of uh, what I want to cover in terms of cash performance. There's a lot more cover, uh, to cover over here, but we don't have time. Uh, if you're interested in this, there's a lot more material in future courses and also online out there as well. And also lectures, as you can find out. So we didn't cover some ideas like victim cash. I think these are interesting, but they're a bit old for today's uh, systems. If you're interested, you can take a look at uh, the lectures. But there are other, other ideas that are quite interesting, which we're not going to uh, cover today. Any questions? Was that example convincing? Did that convince you that you should really not optimize just for miss rate? Okay, good. Yeah, I think it all boils down to coming up with fundamental examples like this. That's how you can improve systems uh, in the end. So it's, ba it's basically boils down to doing stuff on pen and paper <laughs> and figuring out what you should really improve. Okay, so let's talk about multi-core issues in caching. I want to spend some time over here because multi-core imposes uh, a lot of other interesting issues uh, in caches. And as we discussed, all of our systems are multi-core, right? So in this system, for example, L1 caches were private. I believe L2 caches were also private. L3 cache was shared across processors. So even that's a design decision that you need to make, right? Which caches are shared by which cores? And then uh, do you design higher level caches that are shared? Etc. So uh, you, you're used to these pictures right now. I will mention this cache over here because it's very interesting. This is a shared cache that's on a different chip. So basically, they've decided to add these uh, other, uh, let's say, um, other chips that are bonded on top of a processor chip. And the whole purpose of the other chip is to cache. And there are a lot of actually really interesting technology issues, like how do you align the uh, interconnects in this chip uh, with this chip? over here so that they can actually communicate with each other nicely. So there are a lot of fabrication and uh, reliability issues over here that we take for granted uh, right now. But these are two different chips bonded together uh, on top of each other. And the whole purpose of the second chip is just caching, basically. Caching for all of those cores that are in the other chip. And there are many cores over there. OK. Uh, so basically, uh, cache efficiency becomes a lot more important in a multi-core or multi-threaded system. If you have a single thread accessing the cache, that's nice, you can manage it. But then if you have 10 different threads or 20 different threads or 100 different threads accessing the same cache, now you better be a lot more efficient. The same is true for memory bandwidth. Actually, memory bandwidth is even, even more important potentially. Uh, so that's why uh, there, there have been a lot of uh, research in uh, multi-core systems or caching for multi-core systems. Basically, memory bandwidth is at premium. You don't want to go to main memory. You want to basically ideally hit in caches. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. And also a cache space is a limited resource across cores and threads. So both space and uh, bandwidth are problems. Then the question becomes, how do we design caches in a multi-core system? There are actually many, many interesting design decisions over here. Uh, are they, should they be shared or private across cores or threads? We're going to look at this one. How do you maximize the performance of the entire system as opposed to just a single thread that we've been talking about so far? How do you provide quality of service to different threads? How do you provide predictable performance? If some thread, for example, needs really hard deadlines, because it could be a GPU, for example, it needs to display a frame uh, on a uh, video frame, for example, on the screen. And if you actually skip some things, that's not going to be great for the quality of service provided to the user. It could be a safety critical thing also. Basically, there are a lot of interesting issues over here. Should the cache management algorithms be aware of the different threads accessing them? Right. Uh, we have not talked about this so far. But maybe yes. And how should space be allocated to threads in a shared cache, uh, assuming that you actually want to do the space allocation across different threads? 
And then there are other issues, like if the bandwidth is at premium and if the space is at premium, should you actually start compressing the data that's in your caches? It's actually, I think, an important area. And people have been looking at compressing data inside the caches, compressing data inside the memory so that they can actually store more data, reducing the redundancy and waste in the data. And also, how do you do better reuse prediction and management in caches? We've been talking about reuse prediction and management, but you need to do better uh, in, the, in all of these. And there may be other questions also. But let's take a look at one uh, dimension of this, which is basically, should the cache be private or should the cache be shared across cores? Or a subset of cores, right? Uh, you could generalize this. So a private cache, uh, a cache belongs to one core, uh, which means that a shared block can be in multiple caches. Right? Whereas a shared cache, cache is shared by multiple cores. Basically, the L2 cache over here is shared by multiple cores, as you can see. And if there is a block that's shared across those different cores, it doesn't need to be replicated across different caches, essentially, if the cache is shared. A block is on, in only one place, essentially. So you can see there's one immediate advantage of a shared cache. It reduces the replication across different private caches. Right? So I'm not even talking about L1 caches. As we discussed yesterday, L1 caches are very tightly coupled with the core. So the design decisions are uh, usually, oh, it's obviously private, right? <laughs> because it's part of the core. Right? Whereas L2 cache is outer cache. So maybe it's not private, maybe it's shared. Today, some L2 caches are private, some L2 caches are shared, but L3 caches are almost always shared today. Well, I should probably say always shared. Uh, okay, so basically this is the concept of resource sharing. Uh, so if you look at the private caches over here, you're dedicating the cache to the core, and each core has a cache associated with it, L2 cache. Uh, but if you look at this other shared cache, you're sharing the resource. Instead of dedicating a hardware resource to a hardware context, Gen more generally, we allow multiple hardware contexts to use it. So it could be core, it could be thread, because we, have, we can have multi-threading within a core also, right? So it's good to think about this. Essentially, that's the concept of resource sharing. And the resource sharing can be many things. It could be functional units that are shared. It could be the pipeline that are shared. If you remember the fine-grained multi-threading, we shared the pipeline, we shared the functional units, we shared the entire pipeline, essentially, across different threads. Uh, it could be the caches, as we've discussed, but also it could be the buses memory, interconnects, and storage. A lot of those actually are shared across threads because they're too expensive to replicate. Buses are expensive, memory is expensive, interconnects and storage are expensive to replicate. So you do share them across different threads. Caches are, some of the caches may not be too expensive to replicate. So why, what is the benefit of resource sharing? Why do we share resources? Because it improves utilization and efficiency. That leads to higher throughput, higher performance. Why? Because when a resource is left idle by one thread, Another thread can use it. Right? There's no need to, uh, and also there's no need to replicate shared data. These are two different things, actually. Uh, I've given you an example of uh, instruction versus data caches yesterday, right? If you actually partition them, it's the same example, basically. You have two different cores, uh, core one and core two. Uh, if you actually have private caches of 64 kilobytes each, one core may be using one kilobyte of its own private cache, another core may be needing 127 kilobytes. But if you dedicate it 64 kilobytes, and partition that across different cores, the core that needs 127 kilobytes would be unhappy. The core that, has, uh, that needs only one kilobyte would be happy, but it would be underutilizing its cache. So you'd basically waste space uh, because of this. If you had a shared 128 kilobyte cache for both of them, both of the cores would be happy and you would not be wasting space, right? And you would not be increasing the execution time with the same amount of resources. So basically, uh, that's the advantage of resource sharing. It improves the utilization and efficiency, and hopefully that improves performance in the end. And also, there's no need to replicate the shared data, which we also discussed, which we're going to discuss when we talk uh, about uh, cache coherence as well. Uh, but there are other benefits, which uh, one benefit is it reduces communication latency. Uh, data shared between multiple threads can be kept in the same cache in multi-threaded processors, for example. If you have a shared cache, for example, you don't need to go to some other cache to get the data that's shared with someone else. As we will see in cache coherence, you may need to do that, actually. It's in a shared location. Everybody access that from that shared location. It could be in the L2 cache, but you could also think about this in the L1 cache, right? In the L1 cache, you have multiple threads, and multiple threads are sharing a cache block, and they can access it quickly from the L1 cache. Okay. And also, uh, this is compatible with the shared memory programming model, because in shared memory programming model, different threads actually... Uh, communicate with each other using load and store instructions. One thread stores to a location, another thread reads from uh, that location. Have you guys seen the shared memory programming model in any courses? Parallel programming? Not yet? Somewhat? Okay. Who has not seen it? 
Okay, some people have not seen it. Who has seen it? Okay, we see almost 50-50 over here. <laughs> who, who, who may have seen it but doesn't remember? If they have seen it. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it's good. It's good that you're honest. But in, in shared memory programming model, memory is shared across different threads logically uh, and also physically normally. Uh, but whenever a programmer writes a program, a thread can do a store to a memory location. Another thread can see that store and load from that memory location. That's how we can synchronize between the threads, for example. We're going to look at that uh, in cache coherence also. And this is uh, sharing of a cache is very compatible with that model, right? That model says there is a single memory, and anybody can see that memory, read from that memory, write from that memory. It doesn't talk about replication of memory, right? Caches, private caches are essentially replicating uh, pieces of that memory uh, locally uh, next to the processor, right? So it's, in a sense, it's not, uh, from a principled perspective, it's not compatible with that model. Of course, it's compatible in the sense that this is all under the hood, right? You're still uh, obeying the shared memory programming model uh, from the software perspective. Okay, so these are actually the advantages. But unfortunately, resource sharing has disadvantages as well. Uh, one of the major ones is uh, it actually results in contention for shared resources. When the resource is not idle, another thread cannot use it, basically, because somebody occupied that resource. Right? That's true for any kind of resource. It could be cache space. It could be uh, bus bandwidth. It could be some memory space. It could be some storage space. Uh, Basically, if the space is occupied by one thread, another thread needs to reoccupy it if it actually wants to use it. And this leads to reduction of performance. It could reduce each thread's performance. It could reduce some thread's performance. Uh, if you're lucky, maybe it doesn't reduce anyone's performance because the block you're evicting is not going to be reused by the thread that occupied it earlier, right? for example. Right? But usually, it leads to some performance reduction for some thread or all threads. Basically, thread performance can be worse than when it's run alone, and that's actually true in many cases. The other issue, which is different from this performance, this is performance degradation, but you, uh, the resource sharing, if it's not controlled, leads to performance isolation uh, or eliminates performance isolation. Basically, uh, you get different amounts of cache space, for example, allocated to you based on who's running together with you in the shared cache, right? You may be running with different applications at different times, so you optimize this beautiful application that you wrote it very nicely. You fit it in the cache, in the L2 cache you thought you would have. And when you run it with application A, you get that amount of cache, so your performance is great. When you run together with application B, that application B is very aggressive. It kicks out all of the cache blocks that you need to have in the cache because you optimize your program, and your program's performance is terrible. So this eliminates performance isolation. The programmer was programming or optimizing for hardware assuming that it would get some amount of cash, right? But you didn't get amount of, that amount of cash because the resource was shared across different threads and the program has no control over that clearly. The system has control over which threads are scheduled with each other. And as a result, uh, your, uh, all of your optimizations are essentially useless, let me put it that way. So that's the importance of performance isolation. You may optimize your program and you may not, uh, if, if you get performance isolation in the resources, meaning that you actually get the assumed resources uh, uh, in hardware, then uh, your performance is predictable across different runs. OK, so this is the downside of uh, not having performance isolation, uh, because uh, you, may not, you, you get very inconsistent results in terms of performance. Uh, and also, this regrets uh, quality of service, which is related to performance isolation. So if you don't control this sort of sharing, uh, you can have unfairness or starvation. Essentially, some thread may be hogging the resources, and another thread can be delayed indefinitely, if you will. Uh, we're going to see examples of this maybe in a later lecture, but I'm going to actually show you uh, an example with the caches soon. So we could keep adding some more over here, uh, but basically you need to efficiently and fairly utilize shared resources. If you're actually doing share resource sharing, if you say, I'm going to share the cache, you need to have mechanisms to do this efficiently and fairly, such that uh, you, you get quality of service and you get performance isolation if it's needed uh, for the programs. Again, we're not going to go into how to do this, I'm just foreshadowing some of the problems that, we, that, are, that exist in modern systems. In fact, some, uh, some processors have a quality of service mechanism incorporated into them right now. Intel, for example, has a way of partitioning the cache across different, uh, uh, across different applications and some amount of control on partitioning the memory bandwidth as well. This didn't exist actually 15 years ago, et cetera, or even more recently, maybe 10 years ago. Okay, now let's analyze this private versus shared caches uh, from this resource sharing perspective. As I said, private cache, cache belongs to one core, shared cache, cache is shared by multiple cores. 
So what is the advantage of shared cache? You get high effective capacity. Anyone can utilize this big cache, right? That's good. You don't basically, uh, you don't have this uh, fragmentation uh, in, in, inside the cache. Uh, because you dynamically partition the available cache space, uh, there's no fragmentation due to static partitioning. And if one core doesn't utilize some, uh, some space, another core can. So this is nice, clearly. And it's also easier to maintain coherence. We're going to talk about that. Uh, it's because a cache block is in a single location, right? It's not replicated across caches, which means that if one cache up, uh, one processor updates it, it's fine. Everybody sees that update because it's shared, right? So that's good. And we're going to see coherence a little bit more. So the disadvantages, actually, we have not talked about this, but if a resource is shared, uh, you, cannot uh, you cannot customize it to, the, uh, uh, to, to, different, uh, to a single processor, for example. Whereas if you have a private cache, you can customize it. You can couple it nicely, tightly with the core, and it can actually have very high, high throughput. Whereas it's shared, you need to have some sort of network to communicate between the cores to the cache, right? Assuming the cache has a lot of banks, for example, to service. So basically, you get slower access in the end. And as we discussed, uh, cores uh, incur misses uh, by evicting each other's uh, blocks, essentially. This is, these are misses due to intercore interference, if you will. And some cores can destroy the hit rate of other cores, basically, depending on the access patterns again. Right? One core may have very nice locality in the cache, uh, but it may be using, I don't know, 10% of the cache, shared cache. Uh, 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 yeah, a, a very small amount of cache. It may need a very small amount of cache. The other core may, uh, may be streaming through memory, and actually it needs 10 times the size of the cache. When, when they actually share the cache, the second core actually kicks out all of the blocks that the other core would otherwise have if it were actually running alone in the system. So basically, that's what happens. I'm going to demonstrate this pictorially as well. And essentially, guaranteeing a minimum level of service or fairness to each core becomes harder because of the sharing. How much space do you provide? How much bandwidth do you provide? You need to answer these questions, actually, when you're designing the resource. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, basically, if you look at uh, this example, we have two cores, very simple. Thread one is running on this core. And when it's running, it demands almost all the cache, as you can see, L2 cache. Uh, thread two is running on this other core, and it demands some of the cache, let's say, when it's running alone. And when they run together, thread, uh, thread one occupies most of the cache because it may have a very intensive access pattern, right? And as a result, thread two gets much less than what it really needs to get high performance. Maybe it gets nothing almost, right? Because thread, thread one actually can be very intensive in terms of memory accesses, so it could. It could be generating 10 requests uh, at the same amount of time. T2 is generating one request, for example, right? It could be 100, actually. It could be very, very widely different. As a result, Thread 2's performance may be significantly reduced due to this unfair cache share. And this is a real problem in existing systems. That's why you need to design the resources uh, to be shared, assuming you want the benefits of sharing. But also, you should, allow, you should not allow this to happen in existing systems. OK, I could go. On and on, but unfortunately, we're not going to go into how to do that. Basically, resource sharing and partitioning are at odds with each other. Sharing improves resource utilization, for example, better utilization of space. Partitioning provides performance isolation or predictable performance because it dedicates space to a single thread or a single core. The key question is, can we get the benefits of both? And the idea is basically design, uh, have sharing in the resources, but design mechanisms in those shared resources such that they're efficiently utilized controllable and partitionable. So you need to have mechanisms to do have controlled sharing, essentially. And the hope is that this way, you have no wasted resource, which is a problem with dedicated space partitioning. And you have quality of service mechanisms that you added uh, to avoid the problems that you have with sharing. OK? Unfortunately, you're not going to get the perfect <laughs> uh, upsides of both, uh, but you're going to get most of the benefits of both if you do this. And again. We don't have time to go over this. These are more advanced topics, but you can look at future slides or take courses, et cetera. Actually, there, there's a lot more over here uh, I don't have time to cover, but this, these issues exist whenever you have shared resources. And in modern systems, uh, resources uh, inside the core are shared across threads. So there is resource sharing inside the core. There is resource sharing outside the core. And outside the core, after, after some point, everything is shared across many threads. Imagine you have thousands of 10,000s of threads, and they're really sharing a memory. And memory bandwidth is limited. This is what we see to, in today's multi-core systems and GPUs, for example, or machine learning accelerators. So basically, uh, there are a lot of issues that you see uh, today. OK, so let me give you another uh, dimension over here, uh, uh, which is cache coherence. 
How many people have learned about cash coherence? Let me ask you the same questions. How many people have not learned about cash coherence? How many people may have learned about cash coherence, but they don't remember? That's okay. <laughs> okay. So let's learn about cash coherence because this is important. So basically, uh, we're, we have the shared memory programming model, as we've discussed. Threads and parallel programs communicate through shared memory. Thread zero writes to an address. And thread one reads from that address. This implies some communication between two. This is how you can communicate between threads. And also processes, right? Processes are actually uh, larger entities which may contain many threads. So this is one example. This thread is running on processor zero. It's writing to memory location A. This thread is running on processor one. It's printing memory location A. So there needs to be some communication, as you can see over here. Now, if this is the model, each read that happens should receive the value last written by any processor, right? Otherwise, you'll have inconsistency in the program. And there needs to be some proper synchronization between the threads, which we're not going to get into. That's a higher level uh, concern. Basically, the programmer needs to synchronize these threads such that there should be an uh, agreement among the threads as to what, what is last written mean, right? This is, you use locks, barriers, uh, et cetera, to do the synchronization, which we're not going to cover here. Uh, so we're going to cover the issue with caching. Basically, if you have memory location A that's cached in either processor, we have a problem, basically, because the processors may not see the updates of other processors unless you do something special, which is called cache coherence, essentially. So the basic question is, if multiple processors cache the same block, same cache block, how do they ensure that they all see a consistent state for that particular cache block, right? So we have two processors over here, processor one, processor two. They have private caches, cache one and cache two. And there's some network through which they communicate to main memory. And we're gonna look at this particular cache block X whose value is initially 1000, right? So let's take a look at what these processors do. Let's say processor two loads X into some register or part of X into some register. Let's say the value it loads is 1000. That's nice. One, the X, is, X gets cached. What does that sound over here? Am I doing this or? <laughs> no, it's just the tick tick sound. I don't know, maybe this is too close. Okay, uh, so basically uh, the, this, uh, mm, uh, this location X gets cached in this cache. And let's assume that processor one does the same thing. It loads X into its own R2 and this location gets cached over here. And then processor one does something else. It basically does uh, uh, updates location X. And this update gets reflected in the cache. It's a write back cache, let's say. Now you have inconsistency, right? Main memory is not updated and this cache is not updated. Then the question is, what should this processor load? When it loads X, should it load 1000? Actually, the easiest answer is should not load 1000, but this also depends on something else, which I don't want to get into, which is a memory consistency model. But the Intuitive answer is really this should not load 1000, right? Because the value got updated before you actually uh, should read 1000, right? You should really get the most up to date value, assuming the program is synchronized in a particular way. Makes sense, right? That's the intuitive answer. There is a much more complicated answer that requires you to really understand memory consistency, but that's something you should really uh, look at in uh, advanced courses. Okay. So a basic idea is how do you actually ensure that this processor doesn't load the wrong value? That's the basics basically. Well, uh, the first idea is basically whenever this processor does a write, it broadcasts that it's going to do a write to that block and everybody who has the block in their cache invalidates the block, right? This is a, this is a, this is a very basic cache coherence protocol. It's a broadcast based cache coherence protocol. You should not write to this block until you're sure that everybody has invalidated the block. Right? That's one answer. The other answer is while you're writing to the block, you also write to all of the other caches blocks. Basically you broadcast the fact that you're writing and also the data that you're writing. Here, update, the, update your cache block because I'm writing to it. That's the idea. So that's the idea of a broadcast-based protocol. A processor or cache broadcasts its write or update to a cache block to all other processors. And another processor or cache that has the block either invalidates or updates its local copy of the block. So then the question becomes, do you invalidate, do you update? We're not gonna get into that. That's a more advanced uh, question. But if you invalidate, that's enough basically. And if you ensure that there are no race conditions, meaning that someone else doesn't read the old value of the block before that write actually happens, uh, then uh, this should be okay. Okay, that's the idea basically. 
And this works nicely if the processors are connected through a medium or caches are connected through a medium where broadcasts are immediately visible to all of the other caches, which is essentially a wire, right? Which is a bus in this case, okay? That limits the scalability of these protocols in general. So let me give you a very simple cache coherence scheme. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail, but because it implements whatever I said, basically. Whenever a processor writes to a cache block, it sends a broadcast message saying that I'm writing to the cache block and everybody else invalidates the cache block if they have it in the cache. Uh, so all caches somehow observe each other's write and read operations. If a processor writes to a block, all others invalidate the block. So a simple protocol with some assumptions, you can study this on your own. Local processor can do read or write to the cache block. And based on those actions, uh, bus read and bus write are broadcast on the bus for the block. And this is what uh, the protocol looks like. It's, it has two states. Because it's a write-through cache, it doesn't have a dirty bit. That's the simplest protocol. Uh, so basically, you have a valid state or invalid state. If a processor writes to that cache block, it has to be valid, hopefully. Then it sends a bus write signal. This is the input. This is the output. And whenever a processor sees a bus write in its valid state to a given block, it makes the block invalid. Right? This is a very simple state machine that you're used to right now. Right? And that's the idea, basically. With these assumptions, this is a working coherence protocol. Each, And you didn't really increase the number of bits that you have uh, in the valid bits, let's say. Normally, in coherence protocols, you actually need to increase the number of bits, if you will, because you may need to track modified, for example, and exclusive, et cetera. Uh, but we don't have time to discuss all of that. Makes sense, right? OK, let me give you another uh, coherence protocol. We're not going to a lot of detail, uh, but I have to, to cover this because modern, pro modern protocols are a combination of both. They're both broadcast-based, but they're also directory-based. So the idea in the directory is have a middleman. Have a middleman arbitrate updates to a cache block or request to a cache block. And that middleman is called the directory. That middleman is logically centralized. But of course, if you want to scale a system, you don't want centralized components. So that middleman is usually physically distributed across different memories, but we're not going to talk about that. Essentially, imagine a central directory that keeps track of which caches contain every possible cache block. Every cache, before doing something to the cache block, consults this directory and asks for permission. Basically, I want to write to this cache block X. Can I do it? It basically goes to the directory. In this case, it's next to the main memory, but it, directory can also be cached actually next to the caches. So that's very fascinating. You can cache the directory that provides cache coherence. So caching is so powerful because this is actually huge. This thing is huge. And if you take the computer architecture cards, you'll calculate the size of it and you'll see that it's huge. Uh, but basically, uh, whenever you're writing to X, processor one wants to write to X, processor one says, I want to write to X directory, please give me permission. And the directory says, okay, let me see who else has X because it has a bit vector that keeps track of which other caches in the system actually have X, which means that you need to have a bit vector or some data structure for every single cache block in the system to keep track of who, who has that cache block in the, their caches. Right? Uh, assuming, uh, assuming that you have that data structure, directory says, oh, I think uh, I know that cache two actually has cache block. I'm going to send a message to cache two and uh, ask cache two to invalidate that cache block. And after it receives responses from all of the caches that have the cache block saying that they've invalidated the cache block, directly tells cache one or processor one, go ahead, you can write it. You have the only permission or the only copy. Makes sense, right? So this is basically a middleman. Clearly this middleman is costly because you're going through a middleman, this is an indirection. And as a result, the latency of this coherence scheme is much longer than the latency of what we have discussed over here, right? Here, some, uh, one, one processor broadcast, everybody sees, you don't need to go through any middleman. So that's much lower latency. But this is not scalable because if you want to actually have 200,000 processors connect to a single bus, good luck with that. Even more than 16 is not easy, unfortunately, today. But we have today multiprocessors that are on the orders of tens of thousands, right, that are connected to each other. And that's why, well, this is the reason why we have things connected, assuming you have cache coherence, of course, right? OK, uh, so I will not go into this detail, but whatever I described applies. An example mechanism looks like this. For each cache block in memory, you store p plus 1 bits in the directory, and that's costly. Now imagine doing a calculation of this. What's the size of the directory? If you, uh, p is the number of processors that you have in the system. If you have tens of terabytes of memory, if you have cache blocks of 64 uh, bytes, 
you divide 10 terabytes by 64 bytes and multiply by P plus one. That's the number of bits you have in the directory. That's actually a lot uh, larger than your caches, actually, in fact. OK, but assume that you have it somehow. You have one bit for each cache, indicating whether the block is in the cache, that local cache or local processor. In this case, processor and cache can be used interchangeably because we're assuming a processor is a private cache. And we also have another bit, exclusive bit, saying that a cache whose bit is set uh, has the only copy of the block and can update it without notifying others. So there could be optimizations that you can do, basically. You can, this directory can grant permission to a cache that requested to update the cache block saying that, okay, you have the cache block, you can update it until I take away your permission. And you don't need to notify me while you're updating this because I guaranteed that no other cache had this block, has this block, right? So basically you can do a lot of interesting optimizations with directories. Uh, so on a read, the directory, uh, the, uh, the, the cache sends a message to the directory and the directory sets the cache as bit in the directory entry for the block and arranges the supply of the block into the cache. If it was updated by some other processor, for example, it takes the data block from that processor and gives it to the processor that's reading it, right? And on the right, uh, the directory makes sure that it invalidates the block in all caches that have the block and resets the bits of those caches in the directory entry for the block because it's going to give the uh, cache block to someone so that, that someone can update it, right? And we have an exclusive bit associated with each cache block in local caches so that the cache can know to update the exclusive block silently without notifying the directory. So if it got permission for this cache block from the directory, it sets its bit called the exclusive bit in the tag store, saying that, oh, I'm accessing this block and the exclusive bit is set, which means that I know now that I'm the only cache that has the copy in the system and I can silently update it without going through the directory. Okay, or I can read it also without going through the directory, right? Okay, make sense? So now you know the two basic uh, coherence methods. Uh, it's important to know, I think, uh, this much. If you want to know about optimizations, you'll have to take the future courses. And this is, for example, uh, the state machine for each cache block that's implemented in Pentium Pro Pro Processor. It's called the MESI protocol. Uh, the protocol that I showed you was valid invalid. Actually, with the directory, we looked at an exclusive bit. MESI is, there are four bits, basically four states, invalid state, exclusive state, shared state, and modified state for each cache block, basically. Exclusive means, basically, I'm the, I have the only copy of the cache block, so I can write to it. Okay. And there are a lot of other things over here, but we don't really have time to talk about those. It's fascinating, but now we have to move to prefetch. Any questions? Okay, I think people are ready for a break. Yes, so let's go, let's come back at 1520 again and we'll start prefetching. <laughs>
Okay, let's get started. Uh, so now that you are exposed to many interesting things in caching at some level of detail, let's talk about prefetching. Uh, prefetching is another area uh, in computer systems, computer architectures that are extremely important. And this is an area where a lot of innovation is still possible, actually. We need better, much better prefetching algorithms. Uh, as you will see, hopefully, and mechanisms. So these are similar. Uh, unfortunately, your books don't cover any of these at all at this point. Uh, so we're talking about something that's not in your books. Uh, so you can look at some papers, but the slide should be explanatory. And you may also find some questions in your homeworks uh, and past exams related to prefetching. Okay, uh, so what is prefetching? As we have talked about in the past, the idea is very simple. You pre-fetch or pre-load. You fetch the data before it's needed. That's why it's called pre-fetch, right? Uh, by the program. Makes sense, hopefully. So clearly, this is a speculative execution mechanism, right? We, as we, uh, if you remember, we define speculative execution as doing something before you, need, you know that you need to do that thing. You basically fetch the data before you need to know that you, you, know that you actually need the data, right? So that's the idea. Why? Well, clearly, memory latency is high. If we can prefetch accurately and early enough, we can reduce or eliminate that latency. Right? That's the idea. So this works together with caching, of course. And uh, it can eliminate compulsory cache misses, for example. We classify the cache misses into compulsory capacity and conflict. And this can clearly eliminate compulsory cache misses because it can prefetch data before the processor actually gets to uh, that uh, cache miss. It can actually eliminate all cache misses. Uh, it can eliminate capacity misses, conflict misses, because these are all cache misses that happen because of some reason. But if you actually are able to accurately figure out which address the processor is going to access next, you're going to bring that data earlier into cache or prefetch buffer somewhere. And if you do that accurately, it doesn't matter what kind of miss you're going to have, right? It could be because some other processor requested the block. So uh, you invalidated the block because somebody requested it. That's a coherence miss, essentially, right? If you, act, if you need to access that block again, it's invalid because somebody else updated that block due to the coherence protocol, you invalidated the block. But if you can, if you can early enough say, oh, I need to access this block and I'm going to bring it into my cache, then you can eliminate that miss also right? the next time you access that block, of course. So basically, it's very powerful. Uh, in fact, in the extreme case, you can get rid of caches and if you're perfectly accurate and 100% very high coverage in your prefetches, you can get rid of caches, right? There's no reason to have caches if you are able to perfectly prefetch all your data. But of course, this is not easy. It's actually very, very difficult. So caching and prefetching are both employed in existing processors. Okay, so clearly this involves predicting which address will be needed into the future, right? And of course, this works if programs have some sort of predictable misaddress patterns. Of course, then the question is, what is predictable, right? Predictability is always dependent on the algorithm you use to predict something, right? If you can come up with a better prediction algorithm, some things that you may, you, you may have thought are not predictable may become predictable, right? But of course, some things are very different, They're very difficult to predict. If you're completely random, randomly accessing uh, locations, well, that may be difficult to predict, right? At least in our uh, current mindset, if you will. Okay. Before I go further, I should ask this question and answer it quickly because I already answered it. I said this is a speculative mechanism, right? Uh, but it's a speculative mechanism that's slightly different from other speculative mechanisms like branch prediction. If you have a misprediction, this doesn't affect correctness, meaning you don't need to back up, 
you don't need to flush the pipeline or anything. If you had a branch misprediction, you executed some wrong instructions, you need to flush the pipeline, right? Uh, or you fetched some wrong instructions. In prefetching, you had a misprediction, you brought some blocks that you're not going to use into the cache, fine. It's okay, right? Because your cache already has some stuff that you're not going to use anyway, right? So this is another block like that. Basically, prefetch data at a mispredicted address is simply not used. There's no need for state recovery, essentially. And this makes it actually a much more interesting uh, space to explore. You can actually do very, very interesting things without being bound by correctness constraints. Uh, in contrast to branch misprediction or value misprediction. Okay, with, with the branch misprediction or value misprediction, you need to recover the state because you mispredicted the uh, instructions that you fetched or the data value that you used. So you actually did something wrong in the execution. And if you actually use those results, the semantically your program will be incorrect. Right? Here, there's no such thing. Okay, so keep this in mind. Correctness is an issue, but if you actually change the slide, prefetching and security, that could be a different thing, right? You actually, if you actually prefetch some data that could, uh, that could cause a side channel for someone to guess what you may be doing, right, potentially, and based on what your access patterns may be, and that may actually uh, leak some private data that you may not want to be leaked. So security is a very different issue, basically, than correctness. Okay. So let's talk about some basics of prefetching. In modern systems, and what I'm going to assume in the rest of this lecture is prefetching is done at cache block granularity. So we usually do prefetching of cache blocks. Whenever we talk about prefetchers getting trained, et cetera, we talk about cache block addresses. We don't talk about finer granularity or even coarser granularity usually. And prefetching it can reduce both the miss rate and miss latency, right? Basically, if the data is there before the processor, is ac uh, processor accesses it, you reduce the miss rate. Uh, but if, the, if you started prefetching the data and the processor needed it while the prefetch is in flight in the memory hierarchy, you reduce the access latency to that block, right? You didn't completely eliminate the miss, but the latency of the miss has been reduced because you started the prefetch before the processor actually requested it. So it can actually reduce both. Ideally, of course, you would reduce the miss rate. Uh, and prefetching can be done by, by many entities, hardware, we're going to look at that, compiler, programmer, and the system. And it can also be done at many levels. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about prefetching that's done by the processor, but it can be done by the operating system also, right? So for example, uh, there are operating systems that use sophisticated algorithms to predict what programs may be accessed by a user, and they may actually preload uh, the data or, of those programs into the physical memory from the disk. Right? That's another sort of prefetching done by the operating system. We're not going to talk about that, but the basic idea is the same. Reduce the latency exposed to the user in that particular case. Whenever I start my program, it starts much faster, right? Okay, so let me give you an example uh, from one of my old, let's say drawings, as you can see in this paper, uh, of how a hardware prefetcher fits into the memory system. This is just one example, but to make things concrete, I wanted to show you this. And you can see that this is an old type of system because uh, at, that at that time, memory control used to be off chip, right? Today, memory control is on chip also, on the processor chip. But if you look at this system, this is L1 caches and then L2 cache and then the memory controller, et cetera. But one hardware prefetcher may be next to the L2 cache. Basically, it can observe requests that are coming into the L2, and then it can create some prefetching requests or it can create some tracking entries based on uh, the misses that happen in L2. Basically, it observes the requests coming out of the L2 and coming into the L2. And based on that, it tries to figure out, is there a predictable pattern in those requests? And if there's a predictable pattern, it's generates some prefetch requests and sends them into the L2 request queue. Make sense? So that's the idea, basically. You're you have some structures, hardware structures, observing the accesses that go into the cache and the misses that come out of the cache, addresses, block addresses. And based on that, uh, does some pattern recognition, if you will, depending on the algorithm. In this case, the stream prefetching algorithm. So it's actually it's actually a sophisticated algorithm that we're not going to discuss today. Uh, but uh, based on that algorithm, it decides whether or not to generate prefetch requests to blocks that m that it predicts will be accessed by the processor into the future. And if it generates prefetch requests, they get queued and they get inserted into the memory system like any other request. And hopefully, if the processor accesses it, eventually that data comes to the L2 cache and the processor hits in the L2 cache. Right? 
You can have prefetchers that are working at the iCache level, that at the dcache level, at the L3 cache level, which is not here, at the memory controller. Basically, you could have prefetchers all over the system. And today's systems are like that, actually. You have prefetchers all over the system uh, because one level is not enough uh, to do prefetching. Of course, uh, then the question is, how do you coordinate between those prefetchers? So there are four major questions in prefetching. Uh, what's, when, where, and how? Uh, what is, what addresses do you prefetch? Basically, this is the address prediction algorithm. Uh, we're going to look at that. When is when to initiate a prefetch request? Do you initiate it? Basically, wh where do you place the prefetch request such that hopefully you don't you get the data just in time before the processor accesses it? Uh, that's the ideal, right? This is the this affects prefetch timeliness, if you will. If you're too early, this may not be good because you may actually evict the block that the processor is going to use, or your block that the, the block that's being prefetched can be evicted before the processor uses it. If you're too early. If you're too late, clearly you're not going to reduce the cache miss rate. You may reduce the miss latency. If, in some cases, if you're too late, you may reduce the miss latency very little. So ideally, you would like to prefetch a, a, prefetch a block at the right time, such that the block comes back to the cache right before the processor needs it. Where, actually, there are multiple facets of where. Where do you place the prefetch data? Do you place it in a cache, or do you place it in a separate buffer? In almost all processors today, prefetch data gets pre, uh, placed into caches because it's easy to do. Adding another buffer to the memory system, that's something no one wants to do in general, because you already have lots of buffers in the memory system, like we've seen, right? L1, L2, L3, et cetera. So basically, I'm, going, I'm not going to talk about the trade-offs over here, but caches uh, are the place to prefetch the data into today. Where do you place the prefetcher? Which level in the memory hierarchy? We tackle this. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then there's how. How is also important, because how actually uh, governs, in general, how does the prefetcher operate and who operates it? Is it operated by the software, hardware? Uh, is it cooperative? Uh, is it execution-based, thread-based? Is it hybrid? You have multiple different prefetchers uh, somehow coordinating with each other. So this opens up a lot of questions over here, some of which we're going to look at. So let's talk about what a little bit. What addresses to prefetch? Basically, uh, this is important because prefetching doesn't come for free, right? You want to be accurate, ideally. If you're not accurate, uh, you prefetch useless data, and that wastes resources, right? And we said that efficiency is extremely important today in the memory hierarchy. If you waste resources, you're wasting lots of resources. It's, it's memory bandwidth, which is very precious, cache space or prefetch buffer space, and all of these translate to energy consumption. And these could all be utilized by demand requests that are known to be requested, or more accurate prefetch requests. Basically, you have a trade-off over here. Do you waste these resources or... Do you actually not waste these resources such that something you know is useful is going to use those resources, right? So if you're overly aggressive in prefetching, uh, it could actually be very bad for performance and energy. And modern prefetchers are actually throttled so that they don't get overly aggressive. We're going to talk about that briefly. So basically, accurate prediction of addresses to prefetch is very important. But that's not the only thing that's important, as we will see. So prefetch accuracy is defined as prefetches that are sent by the prefetcher at the de uh, denominator and uh, prefetches that are used uh, by the processor at the denominator, right? So basically, use the prefetchers divided by sent prefetches. So ideally, you would like 100%, of course, right? That's the perfectly accurate. But we will see that if you want to get 100%, you may become conservative, meaning you don't send a lot of prefetch requests. You're very, very careful as to what you send out. Now, it is, it, your accuracy may be 100%, but the number of prefetches you send may be very little, which means that you're not really covering a lot of the cache misses in your program, right? Ideally, you would cover. Your coverage needs to be high. Coverage is what fraction of the cache misses are prefetched, meaning eliminated, right? Ideally, you would like 100% coverage, 100% accuracy, and 100% timeliness, meaning the prefetch comes back to the cache right before the processor accesses it, right? Unfortunately, Getting 100% in all of these is very difficult. So there's a, class, a classical trade-off between accuracy and timeliness. If you increase the accuracy, you become conservative, your coverage reduces. OK, so you need to be careful, basically. That's why a lot of good prefetchers are not perfectly accurate. They have some mispredictions. As a result, they waste some stuff, but their coverage is much higher. OK, so basically, we're going to talk about coverage, some metrics in a little bit, because there are more metrics uh, as well. So how do we know what to prefetch is a key question, basically. Uh, usually what you do is you predict based on past access patterns, 
but not always, as we will see. Execution-based, thread-based prefetchers actually execute the piece of the program to just to prefetch data. So that's not based on past access patterns. But let's talk about past access patterns uh, in a little bit. Or you use compilers and programmers' knowledge of data structures. You provide some hints, or the compiler tries to insert prefetch requests into the program because it knows the access pattern of a program. So both of these are possible. Uh, today, hardware prefetches are actually quite strong. Uh, basically, similar trade-offs exist if you want to do the optimization in software versus hardware, right? Hardware actually sees the access pattern that's happening while the program is running. So it can actually figure out the patterns while the program is running, just like in dynamic branch prediction, right? Software compiler, it needs to profile the code to figure out what's going on. It needs to be conservative because it needs to generate correct code in general. So basically, a prefetching algorithm determines what uh, to prefetch. Now let's take a look at some uh, access patterns. Uh, I like looking at these. So let's look, look at these cache block addresses. Do you think this is a predictable access pattern if it keeps going? Yes, we've seen this before, right? This is a strided access pattern where the stride is one. In this particular case, it's a special stride. If the stride is one, it's called a streaming access pattern. So clearly the processor can figure this out relatively quickly, build some confidence and basically say the next one is at A plus five, A plus six, A plus seven, A plus eight. And it can, have, it can have very good accuracy and coverage also. Okay, maybe slightly harder. Is this predictable? <laughs> Hopefully, yes, because the stride is not one here, it's 42, right? It's still very easy. Basically, these two are essentially equivalent, right? Equivalent in the sense that the hardware that you need to detect the stride is the same in those cases, except the stride is larger in one case. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Is this predictable? No, that's not an IQ test. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Anybody figured out the pattern? I, I forgot, so I have to calculate to get. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Basically, the, the stride is not a single stride. It's a multi-stride. If you compare uh, the stride compared to the prior access, uh, it's always plus two, plus three, plus four, and then it repeats. Plus two, plus three, plus four, plus three plus three, plus four. So this is more complicated to detect, of course. It's called multi-stride. Uh, you need to figure out that this is repeating. But modern processors are actually quite good at doing that, mostly. So modern processors can detect it also without resorting to extremely complex structures. How do they detect it? I'm not going to go into the details again. I'm going to uh, tell you some papers to look at. What about this one? It's a bit harder. These are cache block addresses. And uh, the letters are not equivalent to each other, basically. Different letters. <laughs> uh, 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 are different addresses, essentially. A bit harder. Yeah? Anyone? Maybe you have an idea? <laughs> Going once, twice. Anybody wants to volunteer? Yes? Okay. Yes, XYT is the pattern. Basically, this is a bit harder because... There's some prefetchability here, but that's not perfect prefetchability or predictability, right? Basically, what I can say over here is whenever I see X, I'd better get Y and T, right? I think that's the only thing I can say here. If you find some other pattern, let me know. <laughs> but this is possible to also predict with simple structures and hardware. This is cool. Basically, there's some correlation between different addresses, right? Whenever you see access X, you're going to access Y and T. Similarly, whenever you access Y, the next thing you access is T. But after T, good luck. <laughs> At least based on this, whatever we've seen in this picture, you don't have this pattern, right? But this is also doable reasonably easily, more harder than the prior ones. What about this one? I could keep going for the entire lecture, but this is the last one. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, maybe I'll handle this. <laughs> so basically, there is predictability, as you can see, right? If you just look at this. Uh, there's some base address that remains the same across this and across, let's say, one, two, three, four, five requests, and then the next five requests, and then the next five requests. Oh, sorry, base address that remains different, but the deltas from the base address remain the same. So whenever you get to a base address, you always access plus one, plus 67, plus 18, plus seven, plus 99, right? So once your base address changes, you need to figure that out, and then you prefetch those deltas from that base address. And this is also doable in um, uh, modern processors. There is a, it's a spatial prefetcher, basically. Uh, 
it can basically divide the memory into regions and figure out which base address you may be having. And then based on this base address, it's, uh, it can prefetch different locations from that base address, essentially. Right? It's called spatial prefetch. But there's predictability. And the different hardware is needed for different uh, access patterns. Now, of course, I can give you an example where there's no predictability also, and that also exists. OK, so basically, uh, this is the key in prefetching, figuring out how to predict the access patterns. What are the access patterns? Uh, and there are reasons for these access patterns also. For example, the multi stride is because you're accessing data structures that are of fixed distance from each other, but they're not a single stride. You're accessing different fields in a data structure, right? Uh, they may be of fixed distance, and then you jump to some place. Usually, uh, there, there's some sort of uh, access pattern that may happen. Like you, you access this node, and you access some fields in this data structure, and you have a long stride. And then you access another node, you, you access the same fields in that data structure. So the, uh, the, the distance between the accesses are constant, let's say plus 2, plus 3, plus 4. And then you have plus 64, and then plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, and then plus 64, and then plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus 64. So that's a predictable access pattern. So there's a reason why these patterns exist because of the program access pattern and structure. OK, so uh, we're going to get back to this. Then the other challenge in prefetching is when to initiate a prefetch request. I've foreshadowed this, but I'll go through this relatively quickly. If you prefetch too early, prefetch data might not be used before it's evicted from the storage. If you prefetch too late, you may not hide the whole memory latency. Uh, basically, when a data item is prefetched, it affects the timeliness of the prefetch. So you need to be careful as to how to do this. Prefetcher can be made more timely by making it more aggressive. More aggressive means you try to stay far ahead of the processor's demand access stream in hardware, or you move the prefetch instructions earlier in the code, right, if you're doing it software. So let's take a look at this uh, example. So how do you make a prefetcher like this more timely? Whenever you see, whenever you detect a stride, let's say you detect a stride uh, over here when you see a plus two, you basically say, oh, I'm confident that I have a stride of one because I've seen that stride twice. So there should be some confidence threshold also. Then you say, basically, I'm going to prefetch the next 20 incarnations of the stride. I'm going to prefetch from A plus three to A plus, I don't know, 22, right? That's aggressive, clearly, right? Because you don't know when this access pattern will end. Maybe it will end after address A plus five. Or maybe it ends at this point, right? <laughs> and all of the, everything you prefetch is going to be useless. So this is the trade-off between accuracy and coverage. If you're aggressive, your timeliness is actually better also, and your coverage also better. But unfortunately, being more aggressive like that reduces your accuracy because the access pattern may end at some point, and you may not go up to A plus 22, right? OK, so being aggressive helps the timeliness. Being aggressive helps the coverage also. But it has downsides in terms of accuracy uh, and also intensity on the bus, for example, right? Or you can move the prefetch instructions earlier in the code. That's also aggressive because if you move a prefetch instruction early in the code, it's actually a lot easier than code scheduling because if you schedule the regular instruction in the code, you have a lot of constraints in terms of not violating the semantics of the code, right? But if you move the prefetch instruction early, you need to, of course, calculate the address somehow. That's one issue. But assuming that you can do that speculatively, then uh, that prefetch happens. But then the code may not go to a location where that prefetch is needed, right? It may actually take a lot of branches, and eventually you don't need that block, right? So that's another trade-off, basically, timeless and accuracy, as you can see. OK, so the uh, other challenge is where. Where has multiple aspects, as we discussed. Which level of cache do you prefetch into? Uh, you, do you prefetch from memory to L4, L3, L2, L1? I'm not going to go into all of the trade-offs over here, but it's kind of similar to where do you bring the data into it on a read into the cache, right? Uh, usually, you don't prefetch into L1 because L1 is very small. And if you actually do a lot of prefetching into the L1 all the way from memory, then you may be more speculative. There are more careful prefetchers. Basically, you need to be more careful when you prefetch into the L1. If your cache is very large, you, need to be, you, can, you can afford to be less careful, let's say. Uh, do you have separate prefetcher between levels? That's what happens today, for example. And then there's another where. Where do you place the prefetch data in the cache? Do we treat the prefetch blocks the same as demand fetch blocks? That's another question, basically, right? So far, now we, we can complicate our, uh, uh, all of those policies that we talked about in the cache. All those policies assume we have demands, loads, and stores. What about prefetches? Now, we don't know if they're correct or not. But again, you can perhaps uh, gather some metrics about prefetching based on the past, right? You can say, oh, my accuracy is quite good. So maybe I should place this block in a location that's not going to be evicted soon, right? 
my accuracy is so so maybe i should place in the middle of the lru uh, stack right not maybe i should not treat it as most recently used but somewhere in the middle right okay so basically prefetch blocks are not known to be needed uh, with lru management policy a demand block is placed into the mru position is that the right policy for prefetches i don't think that's not uh, about uh, there, uh, there's data that clearly shows that that's not the right policy for all prefetches but if you know more information about the accuracy and usefulness of the prefetches that may be the right thing to do for a particular prefetch then the question is do we skew the replacement policy or management policy such that it favors the demand fetch blocks for example there have been some processors that prefetched uh that placed all the prefetches into the lru position these recently used position in the in a way in a cache that was a bad idea also let's say but with the prefetcher they had maybe it was an okay idea at the time this was we're talking about 2000s but right now actually the policies are much more complicated uh, I'm going to recommend the paper that talks about this, but we're not going to have time to cover it. Uh, so where do you place the hardware prefetch in the memory hierarchy? We discussed this actually briefly. In other words, what access patterns does the prefetcher see? Does it see all accesses to the L1? Does it see only L1 misses? Does it see only L2 misses? This depends on where you place the hardware prefetch. Right? Seeing a more complete access pattern can get you potentially better accuracy and coverage in prefetch. Right? But unfortunately, prefetcher needs to examine more requests if it sees a more complete access pattern, right? And this basically makes the design a bit harder because you may need more ports into the prefetcher, right? So this is a similar issue like we, as we discussed yesterday on multi-level caching, right? The first level cache, uh, the, the requests that are seen by, the accesses that are seen by the first level cache are very different from the accesses that are seen by the third level cache because there's filtering that happens, right? In terms of what's hit and what missed. Prefetchers are the same basically. So detecting the access pattern may be more difficult at the outer levels because uh, the locality is filtered. On the other hand, you can also make an argument that you're seeing fewer requests. So you can actually detect the access pattern or a pattern assuming one exists uh, to detect uh, more easily because you're dealing with fewer requests uh, on the outer levels. Okay, basically I put this picture again because you can have prefetchers at all levels over here, including from L1 cache to the register file if you're actually managing your register file uh, speculatively in some cases but not in modern CPUs, at least. You don't do that. You can also do prefetching from the solid state drive to the memory. That's also good to know. And this is actually going to tie in with the virtual memory lecture tomorrow because there could be management that you do because some of your, uh, some of your uh, memory is paged out to the SSD because of the virtual memory that we have. And if you actually predict the access patterns of what you're going to access in main memory next, you can prefetch data from storage into the main memory. Okay, and also in a system that looks like this, prefetching actually becomes even more important because now you have actually two different types of memories that are different from each other in terms of latencies. This, late, this memory may be very low latency. This memory may be relatively much higher latency, let's say 4X or 8X, and then prefetching data from to here to here makes sense. And again, uh, just to stretch your thinking, in a system like this, prefetching also becomes very important. If you're accessing data from remote memory actually, you really don't want to wait for that access latency. So prefetching becomes extremely important actually for those data that you're going to access from remote memory. Makes sense, right? Because if, if you have a system like this, the whole purpose of the remote memory is to have higher capacity. You really don't want the latency of the remote memory, regardless of however low latency your network is. And prefetching is your friend here to make sure that you don't see the latency of that network or that access, but you have the capacity benefits of that remote memory. So that's where the prefetching fits in, basically. In the memory hierarchy, you have this unfortunate trade-off that caused us to have the memory hierarchy in the first place, the capacity latency trade-off, right? We want capacity. We don't want the high latency. These larger memories or larger caches help us with the capacity, but they unfortunately don't have a good latency. But prefetching actually enables the capacity benefits, hopefully by hiding the latency of those memories. OK. So let's talk about how to prefetch, and then I'm going to give you some example of prefetching methods. So software, hardware, execution-based prefetching, these are three major categories of prefetching. In software prefetching, instruction set architecture provides prefetch instructions. I mentioned this before. I'm going to show you uh, examples. And the programmer or compiler inserts prefetch instructions into code. And this usually works well only for regular access patterns, basically. It's, you need to figure out the access pattern, and you need to be able to do prefetching. People have proposed other instructions that are more sophisticated, but these are actually relatively hard to do. In hardware prefetching, you have specialized hardware that monitors the memory accesses, and it memorizes, finds, learns patterns, essentially. 
This could be strides, this could be correlations, this could be multiple strides, this could be some spatial patterns. This is basically based on the imagination and the creativity of the designer. This is very important, I think. This is, this, that's why the scenario that's very ripe for creative, let's say, design, in my opinion. There's uh, a lot of room over here. Uh, and then you generate prefetch addresses automatically in hardware. In execution-based prefetching, you, you create a thread, and this thread is executed to prefetch data for the main program. That's the sole purpose, basically. And this thread can be generated by either the software, programmer, compiler, or hardware, essentially. We're going to see some method of doing it in hardware, essentially. But you can also imagine a software programmer doing this. This is called a pre-execution thread, speculative thread. And this can, this can be very powerful, as you can see, because you create a slice of the program, you prune the program, and that slice is used for just for prefetching data. While you're executing the main program, the slice is also prefetching data to a shared cache, for example, right? And then when the program comes to this load, hopefully that has already been executed or prefetched by the speculative program. Make sense? I'm going to show a picture of that later on. Probably not today, probably next week. Yeah, definitely next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at this prefetch instruction. Basically, this is an x86, it's an old incarnation of x86, but you can find it similar instructions today. Uh, essentially, uh, you pre basically the idea is to prefetch data into caches. And actually the specification is very interesting. Specification is microarchitecture dependent. You can see that if you use prefetch T0, you prefetch data into all levels into cache hierarchy. What does that mean? In Pentium 3 processor, that means first and second level cache. In Pentium 4 Intel Xeon processors, second level cache. Well, you said all levels. <laughs> but L1 cache is special, as I said, right? Even though they say all levels, they ignore the L1 cache. <laughs> we don't touch the L1 cache after Pentium 4. Makes sense, right? And you can see some other things, basically. These are non-temporal data with respect to all cache. Levels. So you can see that in some cases, uh, yeah, these are different, but the, these definitions actually also change over time because these are speculative, these are instructions. In a sense, because these are speculative instructions, they don't change the architectural state. The ISA is not that binding also. That's why they're a bit sloppy also, as you can see, because these are speculative things, right? In the end, it's all for performance optimization. So they can be sloppy in the ISA definition also. The contract is a bit sloppy. In fact, in some cases, they may say this, but they may not, they may actually drop prefetches. Why? Okay, you generate the prefetch instruction. You need to insert into a queue. That queue is full because there are lots of other processors that are contending for that queue. It's a memory controller queue, let's say. What does the designer do? Oh, this is a prefetch instruction, get rid of it. Why? Because it's not important. Because it doesn't affect the architectural state, right? So that's the beauty of prefetching as well as uh, that beauty in terms of the flexibility of design makes the specification sloppy in the sense that, okay, what are you going to specify, right? If you write it like this, fine, but you can do something else underneath. Okay, that's the difference between microarchitecture and architectural state as we, can, as we discussed, right? This doesn't affect the microarchitecture. This doesn't affect the architectural state as you can see. Okay, so this is a hardware prefetcher in IBM Power 4, this is a streaming prefetcher, and they have a nice picture over here that shows basically uh, from L2 to L1, you prefetch, uh, essentially you can think of it this way. Uh, there, there are different prefetchers at different levels, potentially, and these prefetchers are prefetching data in a streaming manner, while L1 is accessing zero and one, you prefetch data the next, let's say five items into L2, and then while L2 is accessing in a streaming manner, you prefetch data into L3 in a streaming manner, the stride is one, as you can see, and memory is also pushing data in a streaming manner. Okay, this is a recommended paper on stream prefetching that introduced the idea of stream prefetching. And you can see this was written in 1990. This is a very influential paper, actually. Uh, and you can see that the missed cost at the time was 70 cycles. Today, we're at the order of 500, 600, 700 uh, to main memory. Okay, let's talk about prefetcher performance metrics. We talk about accuracy. This is the fraction of used prefetches uh, divided by all sent prefetches. Coverage is how many misses do you prefetch? Did you prefetch? Divide by all misses that could have been exposed. And timeliness is on time prefetches divided by used prefetches. I don't want to go into like exact definitions of this because that's not the purpose, but you're going to see it in your, uh, this, this definition is used in your exercises, for example. But there are also other metrics like bandwidth consumption, memory bandwidth consumed with the prefetcher divided by memory bandwidth consumed without the prefetcher. So this affects how much extra bandwidth the prefetcher consumes, right? 
But the good news is you can utilize idle bus bandwidth. You may be consuming more bandwidth, but if it was idle to begin with, meaning no one else needed it, this is okay, perhaps, right, from the memory bandwidth perspective. But then there are also other adverse effects like cache pollution. You may create some extra demand misses due to prefetch placements into the cache. You, prefetch, uh, you place the prefetch into the cache, and then you create a miss that didn't exist if the prefetcher was not there, right? So this is a bit more difficult to exactly quantify, but clearly this affects performance and different works have tried to do this quantification. Uh, let me give you some other interesting trade-off in prefetching. We're gonna talk more about it uh, next week, but this is real data uh, from Sunrock. It used to be, it became Oracle at that after some time. And they use uh, some run ahead or Scott prefetching as they discussed, uh, we'll discuss it next week. But they basically sweep the cache size over here in the simulator and the performance over here. This, the red bar is no prefetching, the blue bar is with prefetching. You can see that if you look at a cache size of 512 kilobytes, with prefetching, they get 40% better performance, right? Now you can also think about prefetching as a way to save hardware. If you don't have prefetching, you rely on caching, let's say. And let's take a look at this example. This is one megabyte cache. If you have one megabyte cache with prefetching, the performance is equivalent to eight megabyte cache without prefetching. So you can see that in this commercial workload that they used to design their processors with, the prefetcher buys seven megabytes, if you will. And then if you go into higher cache sizes, the prefetcher actually buys more. So that's the effect of prefetching. If you want to have ISO performance, you can get that potentially, depending on the access pattern, of course, with just caching or a combination of caching and prefetching. And that combination essentially reduces your cache size that you need in the end. So either you can improve performance uh, for a given cache size, or you can reduce hardware cost if you actually uh, uh, want to minimize hardware cost. Okay, so there are a bunch of things that to discuss in prefetching. We're gonna look at some of these. Uh, this is a recommended paper. We actually worked on prefetching a lot in my career. My, my PhD thesis was on prefetching actually. Uh, I'll mention that a little bit uh, probably next week in the last lecture or the previous lecture, we'll see. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting things to do over here. And so these are actually implemented. This, uh, the, the throttling mechanisms proposed uh, are implemented in real processors, for example. Let's talk about an example hardware prefetcher before we uh, conclude this lecture. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the stride prefetcher and then we're gonna improve it. So we've already discussed this, right? Consider the following stride in memory access pattern, A, A plus N, A plus two N, the stride is essentially N. And this is easy to detect because you basically look at uh, the next request and the prior request, and then you subtract. And then you find the stride. Basically, you record the stride between consecutive memory accesses, and you build some confidence. If the stride is stable across multiple of these subtractions, you use it to predict next M memory accesses. Right? That's the idea over here. Very simple. But even this one has two different types. Do you do it on an instruction basis or memory region basis? So what's the difference? Difference is basically, how do you calculate the stride? Basically, what are the memory addresses you're looking at? Are the memory addresses generated by a single program counter? Then you're instruction-based. Basically, this program counter, this load instruction, generated address A, A plus 10, A plus 20, A plus 30. This is an example, basically. You keep track of the stride on a per program counter basis. Each load or store instruction can lead to a memory access pattern with a different stride. That's the upside. You can detect different strides based on the load instruction. And this actually is quite reasonable uh, to do. And you can see that the hardware that is needed over here is you need to keep track of the program counter, you need to keep track of the last address reference and the last stride, right? And then some confidence bits saying, did the stride change, right? And you can keep track of that also clearly. So this way you can detect strides caused by each instruction. Uh, it cannot detect some things that are detected by the next one that I'm going to talk about. Uh, but timeliness of prefetches can be an issue over here in the other one also. But uh, for example, if you initiate the prefetch when the load is fetched the next time, it can be too late, right? So normally you look ahead in the instruction stream or generate lots of prefetches uh, based on by adding the stride many, many times uh, in, a, uh, in an iterative manner uh, to the addresses, right? Okay, this is basically aggressiveness of the prefetcher like we discussed. But the memory region-based stride prefetching is slightly different. You look at cache block addresses and divide the memory into regions. And based on the region a cache block address maps to, you have a stride in each region, potentially different strides in each region, right? This doesn't have program counter as you can see. This way you can detect strided memory access patterns that appear due to multiple instructions because multiple instructions may be generating strides uh, together depending on the access pattern, right? So for example, this may be a striding access pattern 
where each access could be due to a different instruction. And that's possible. That happens also. And stream prefetching or stream buffer is a special case of memory region-based stride prefetching where n is equal to one. That's what IBM Power 4 implemented, for example. And that's the 1990 paper. Okay. So stride prefetching was introduced by this paper, this instruction-based stride prefetching. And it's also employed in existing systems. For example, uh, Intel uh, processors at the time, I believe they still do, uh, prefetch data into the L1 data cache based on instruction pointer uh, based prefetching, very similar to what I just described, essentially. But existing processors also include memory region-based prefetching mechanisms. And this was the paper that introduced it. So what about more complex access patterns? Simple regular patterns, stride prefetchers do well. Complex regular patterns, multiple regular strides, that's also doable as we will see. And then irregular patterns, linked data structures, indirect array accesses, random accesses, multiple data structures access concurrently. Now you need to be more careful. Let's take a look at the complex regular pattern. So this is a real application. And this is the delta. It's, the stride is also called delta uh, today. Uh, it's also called delta correlation prefetching. What I'm going to describe is a delta correlation prefetcher, basically. And you can see that there's a predictable strides here, right? So the question is, how do you predict it? You need to be able to record it and predict it. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but modern processors are good at doing that with more hardware cost. But you can imagine how to do this, right? Uh, the big key idea is, given a history or signature or pattern of strides, record and predict what stride might come next. You hash the stride somehow, or you concatenate the strides. And based on that, you index into a table that gives you what is the next stride with some probability. Okay, that's the idea, basically. So that's what this is trying to show. Based on the prior three strides, you do some hashing or concatenation. And in the table, the next stride says six with some confidence. Okay? Okay, I'm not going to go into the details because the confidence needs to be done in some way. You can read the papers. Okay, this is the place I'm going to stop. We're going to talk a little bit more about prefetchers in the next lecture. And then we're going to jump to a virtual memory. So have a great weekend. I'll see you next week for the next week is the last week of lectures, right? Okay, for the last week of lectures. See you next week.